established that inventory within our five counties. If you look on missing, which I hope you will after this program, it's the Midwest Invasive Species Information Network. It's a web page that is actually like a clearinghouse, really, for everything invasive species. So it's a place to go to learn how to identify invasive species within the Midwest and a place where you can report locations that you find. You can get a smartphone app so you can report while you're out and about. Just stop and hit a button and you've reported it. And it will help us develop this, this uh, inventory so we can strategize treatments. Um, it also has links to uh, DNR pages which give you treatment advice on different species. So basically this is what we're hoping for and asking everyone to do. Is it's at uh, www.missin.msu.edu is the web page, and this is what the home page looks like. And uh, pretty much at the top, you can register, or if you click on report sightings, it, it will bring you to a page where you either log in or you register. It's simple. It's just your name, your email address. They don't ask for anything too personal. Um, and then we're going to talk about what you can do on this web page. So, so one thing, and the main thing we're asking you to do, let's say you already know right now that you've seen frayed mites or you've seen Japanese knotweed somewhere, and you can report that right now. It doesn't have to be during the season that you can see it if you know it's there. So this is where you would, it gives you an option to report a sighting though. And once you click on the report sightings link, it takes you here, and basically you just move your cursor. You can scroll with your mouse or whatever, and that'll, you know, zoom in on the map. You zoom into your area. You can switch it between uh, aerial photo or the map. So sometimes you can actually see an infestation you're going to report with the aerial photo. You can bring it pretty close. And you just click to drop a pin. If you dropped it in the wrong place, you just click it again, move it, click, and put it where it is. And then you type in the information down here. Um, it will automatically put in your name. Under project, if you are within our five counties, we would like you, when you register, to sign up as North Country Cooperative Invasive Species Management as your project. But if you're, and then on your phone, it will always report in our project. So it's easier for me when I download the data to get that inventory. If you travel around and you're not necessarily just reporting things in these five counties, you don't have to select a project. I think there's an option for like general list of reporting, which is fine too. I can still get that data. Um, it'll automatically fill in the latitude and longitude. You select what date. Um, up here, it'll ask you how big of an area. Generally, they put it in terms of like the size of a football field or the size of I don't remember all the options, but it's pretty easy. Density, you say whether it's you know a monoculture or just a new infestation. You can type in comments. So a lot of times, this is helpful information that we can get that might say it's on this side of the street or you know I don't know whatever information that would be helpful for someone to find that infestation. And they would like you to load um, photos in if you could, especially if you're new to it. So it used to be, there's these tutorials that I'll explain later. I guess I'll get to that later. <laughs> okay, so another thing you can do there is analyze data and look at data and see what's going on with invasive species in your area or wherever you might be interested. So um, if you click on up here, the browse data, um, then that gives you this option. You can search by species if you're interested in just seeing, let's say, where um, Asian longhorn beetle is compared to where we are, where it's been reported so far. You can search by species. If you do something like Phragmites, the web page gets stuck because there's a lot of it in the Midwest. So um, you can search by geography. It'll give you county. And you can search by the project, North Country Sisma. You can search by contributor. You can say, hi, I wonder how much I've reported. You click there and you can see. So, and then these spots show you how many reports in that area clustered. And then if you click on that, it'll zoom into that. 
And you can actually look at the specific data that was collected for that area. So, so here, this search was, I don't know how it was done, but whatever search you do, whatever search criteria, if you scroll down on the web page at the bottom, it gives you a table that you can find other information. You can find who reported it, you can find what date it was reported, um, and you can sort these by just clicking the low alphabetical up or down. And you can download this. This is useful for me. I can download this data to an Excel spreadsheet for our own inventories. So, so then if you want to know more, you click once you get you click those clusters to get close up, and you can click on the point, and it'll tell you all the details about it. So even and don't worry about if a site you're reporting was already reported, because um, that's still valuable information. The density might have changed, the area might have changed. If it's being treated, it might show that the treatment's effective. If it's not being treated, it might be a record of spread. So it's all useful data. Um, and this is the printable record. You can, on that last screen, when that pop-up comes up, it gives you an option to print it. So you can print that up. And for us, like when we have a strike team going on or something, we could print this up as information gives us land long that we can use in our GPS unit to pinpoint the area that you've reported. Okay, another cool thing you can get under the tools, which is at the top of the bar, is uh, maps on demand. And this is just a fun, cool thing if you're interested. You select your species, you select your state, put your email address, and they'll send you this like really cool map. So again, uh, I just think of, um, the Asian longhorn beetle as a great example because that's something we're really worried about moving into this area. So if you wanted a map to see how close it was to your own forest, <laughs> that would be a way to get one. And there's the maps. They're really, really pretty cool that they send you. That's an Asian longhorn beetle? No, that one was actually uh, buckhorn. Okay, so they also have these smartphone apps. So if you go to the Google Play or the App Store, you just search Nissen, and it's free to download, and it's super easy to use. Um, I'm not sure. OK, so basically, you go in to the app. This is what would open when you open the app. And whether you're reporting a plant or an animal, you click on that and say go. And then it goes here and you choose what habit, what category that plant or animal is in. So um, it looks like Russian olive or something over there. I can't really see it. But you would, if you click on shrubs, you saw Russian olive. You click on, this is actually, there's an option once you click on shrubs where you can click on photos. Let's say you're out in the field and you're not sure. You're like, I think it might be blossom buckthorn, but I don't know if I should report it. If you click on the little button that I don't have a screenshot of that says photos, it'll give you all these pictures of the specific details that help you to identify that. So you have that tool in the field as well. Okay, so again, you pick your species, you fill in the area, how dense it is, put any comments, and you can take a picture right there and send the picture. And again, if they don't know you already at Nissen, which eventually, if you're reporting a lot, they'll start to recognize your name and you'll get some credibility. But until then, they like people to um, submit photos if possible. But even if you don't submit photos, that'll go into the database. It's not like someone's gonna go out and kill something until they verify what it is, so. <laughs> um, so then, once you save it, you click OK to add it. So then, back at the home screen, and you kind of have to go back on the phone to get to the home screen. You just kind of hit the back button. And when you hit Send Data, it, that's when you send your data. So let's say you're out and about, and you're marking these things on your phone, but you don't have a great data plan, so you don't want to send data. You don't have to do that while you're out and about. You can wait till you get home to your Wi-Fi and send all your data at once. So um, when you hit send data, it gives you an option of either keeping 
sending now. You know, there's, you can go in and look and see if, oh wait, maybe that wasn't right, and you can delete something off. It gives you an option before you send it. So, I have no idea. <clears throat> Is there a problem with the app? Because I've been trying to update the species catalogs and it won't really be good in there. So you have an iPhone? Yeah. They were having problems with the iPhone, but mine worked. I had to um, dump the app off my phone and then start over to get it to work. So another cool thing you can do if you're really interested, if, it's, if you're managing some land or something, <laughs> You want to know, let's say you want to know if mud Zealand, you know, New Zealand mud snail has um, been reported anywhere in your area. You can sign up for um, alerts. So that's under My Missing, and you click on alerts, and you would get an automatic email if that species was found in the area. So it goes by county, I think. So if a species that you're particularly worried about comes into a county that you're concerned about, you can sign up through my missing alerts to get an automatic email when someone reports that species. So, and here's some cool things. The species information, but when you click on that, they have like a huge catalog of invasive species, not all of which are here, because this is the whole Midwest, and some of them are species that haven't even moved into the Midwest, but they're watching for. But you can click on these, and it opens an information page, and it's really a great source just to learn about identification, learn about the problems posed by them, learn about where they came from. Um, and then they have these identification training modules. I mentioned this briefly before. This is before you start reporting to help you become really uh, confident with reporting. It takes about 10 to 15 minutes per species. We're asking people to at least do the five species that, or the seven species, five plant types that are our high priority plants um, to do the tutorials. It takes about 10 minutes and then there's a quiz at the end. And they really do equip you. They give you the information that you need to confidently identify those plants in the field. Um, so they're really great. The training modules, which you find those under tools on the top bar. So here's the current species training modules they have. They have 60 different ones. Um, and again, we are focusing on the um, Oriental Bittersweet, Glossy Buckthorn, Common Buckthorn, Phragmites, <laughs> Japanese Knotweed, Garlic Mustard. <laughs> So, and it used to be, they used to require you to do the training module before you were permitted to report or before you counted your reports. They changed that and then it used to mean that you would be a trusted source if you had done the training modules. They've eliminated that as well. So when you look, if you report and then you look at who's reporting what, some say general public and some say trusted source. Trusted source is someone who's consistently been reporting invasive species and they've gone and field checked and they're saying, yeah, this person knows their plants. So, um, and you can use it on your desktop computer, your tablets, and then there's the smartphone app, so. Um, here's what the identification modules kind of are. They break it down, it gives you like a little brief botany lesson of the characteristics that you need to identify that species that you're looking at. And they're not just plants either. There's also a lot of the invasive fish and some other things in the modules. Um, and then it goes through the whole thing. Um, and you can always click back to the menu for the training module. Let's say you're going along and then you're like, wait a minute, what did they say about leaf erasure? You can click back and then move back and forth through them. So you take the quizzes and uh, I think they're 10 questions or something. I don't know what happened there. I guess that's my whole presentation. <laughs> so another cool thing you can do on their web page is, and I think it might be under tools. Yes, under tools, click on news 
and it gives you pretty much they keep track of all the latest news articles, syndicated news articles involving invasive species, <coughs> not just in the Midwest, beyond the Midwest and Ontario and all sorts of sources. Very interesting articles, and you can sign up for their um, whatever what do you call it, listserv or whatever that will automatically send you those news articles as well. So you get once a week a list of like three articles to read if you're interested. So it's a good way to um, keep up on things. So here's the cool fun thing <laughs> is we are announcing a missive reporting contest. And I'm going to pass these out. And so So basically, we've developed a little point system for, to encourage people to register on MISSIN and to start reporting. So we are getting one point for each of our top invasive species that are listed at the top, the top five NCCISMA plants to watch for. And we're giving five points for each of the Nixisma plant training modules that you go through and five points for each of the additional State of Michigan watch list species for this area. The State of Michigan watch list species for this area, a lot of them aren't yet in this area or aren't known to exist here, but we're on the lookout for them. They're real nearby, and we don't want them here. So um, the Mason Lake, Misaki, Osceola Lake, and Wexford Conservation Districts are each donating a $25 gift certificate um, for the winners of this contest. And right now is the best time to be out probably finding invasive species, although we can't see quite mighty around. But um, it ends in July of our next semi-annual community meeting will be in July. The exact date and location is to be announced. But you um, can certainly arm yourself with knowledge and register on MISSIN, get the smartphone app loaded, and do some of the training modules before then. And we hope people will compete and report these species wherever they see them in their communities. And, uh, and since you know I can see who reported what, I can look up that information. But as far as the training modules, if, to get that credit, we need you to print the, um, at the end of the training module, once you pass the quiz, which you have to pass with 80% or better, um, you can print a completion sheet, and you can either bring them to our next semi-annual meeting or mail them to our address, which is in the middle there. So, any questions? Teresa. I just want to say a little bit more about the prize, in case people aren't familiar with what a conservation districts do. Each of our conservation districts has a seedling sale in the spring, and some of them have a seedling sale in the fall. And we sell trees, shrubs for wildlife, um, a lot of sell food producing plants, we sell items to help you in your conservation efforts, we sell wildflower seed. Um, so Sherry, would you raise your hand? Sherry covers Misaki County, and if you're from Misaki County and want to know about her sale, see her. Charmaine covers Osceola and the East half of Lake and Danny, or Danny, Danny covers Mason and the West half of Lake. So if you want to know more about your conservation district and what they sell at their annual or semi-annual seedling sale, see one of the four of us and we can let you know more about that. Awesome. Any questions? Yep. Vicki, with, with regard to the reporting, are you looking at a report for 40 acres per section? Kind of what's the criteria? It should be an individual infestation. So it might be huge or it might be small, but it would be one point if you're, you know, if you're reporting a right, huge field that's well, solid. Dry ground, I mean, you can have one every, every row. Yeah, but you got to stop a lot. But yeah, you could. Right. You could. For some of the stuff, you could. Right. So maybe I, I um, looked that up before we said that other people asked if Mission kind of had like their data, like how to enter data protocol. And I think that they requested, say, you have a whole Out 
So, and you know, again, don't worry if it's a site that's been reported before. I mean, don't look at this and then say, well, I know there's some there. I'll report that again. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, any other questions? Yep. So what, what happens with all this information once it's collected? I'm going to download it into our own inventory maps, and then we are going to strategize. Um, we have a three-prong uh, approach to treatment that we've planned so far. One is I'll be doing demonstrations for the public in areas that are accessible to a lot of people and where the public can come and learn how to treat certain our high priority invasive species and um, we'll have sheets available that people will give instructions on how to treat certain invasive species if they want to do it on their own. Each of the conservation districts starting next spring is going to have a community tool crib available for rent by the public. So if you want to treat a certain species, you'll come into your conservation district office and you can uh, say, I'm going to treat you know, Japanese knotweed, and we will have the equipment, everything but the chemical, we will have the safety equipment, um, all the spray equipment, we'll have injectors, everything you'll need to treat that invasive species, and a sheet with instructions that will guide you toward what type of chemical to purchase, and we'll have sources for that, and to aid, aid the public in treating invasive species on their own property. And then the third prong, which has yet to be completely developed, is there will be a cost share program available through us. We're hoping to be able to take this data, if we get enough people reporting, where we can find clusters that need treated on a lot of different private property and have a contractor come in and do it, you know, as a group. Because to get a contractor to come into our area, most of them aren't from our area. They don't want to just treat a little small infestation on one property. So we're going to try to group those and get property owners to coordinate. <laughs> May I add a little bit to for Dan's question? So this website is usable or visible to anybody who wants to access it. So if you or anybody in the room went and said, oh, I know that there's a Japanese knotweed on the National Forest or on a DNR uh, state gaming area, we can see that information. And so we know that, hey, someone just found Japanese knotweed is a high priority species for us so we can go out and treat it. It's also a way for people to know what's moving toward their area. So there are a lot of things in Southern Michigan um, that we don't have in you know, like Wexford County, uh, Manistee County, Basin Lake counties, like Osceola. And so it's a way for us to see that new things are moving into the county as well or toward where we are. So it's a really useful tool for a lot of people. And once again, the more eyes on the ground, the more people filling out this information, the better decisions that we can make about what our priority species are and what we need to treat for that year. Do you have something, George? <coughs> the conservation districts will have these kits, but does that mean that people who are coming in will not need a chemical applicator's license? If you're treating on your own private property, you do not need a chemical applicator's license. So it's only if you're farmers, doing it. Because farmers need an applicator's license. Only for a certain use pesticides. Right, and I thought we were talking Roundup. That's well, one of the. Well, that's, that's, that's not okay. restricted. That's okay. Okay. And we won't be recommending anything that's restricted use. <laughs> Pretty much. Right. No. So anybody else? Okay. At the end, I was going to do a hands-on workshop, but we had a bigger crowd than we expected, and. We weren't sure if there were going to be glitches with the web page. I ran into some issues yesterday. Um, if anyone after the meeting has their laptop or their smartphone with them, there's Wi-Fi here. I can help you get registered with MISSIN if you need to or would like to um, have help with that. Just let me know after the meeting or at lunch or whatever. So if there's no other questions, I guess I'm going to... Pass it on to uh, Josh Shields, John Webb, and Rick Lucas on Eyes on the Forest.